Our gospel lesson today comes from the second chapter of the Gospel of John, beginning in the 13th verse. Listen for the word of God. The Passover of the Jews was near, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and the money changers seated at their tables. Making a whip of cords, he drove all of them out of the temple, both the sheep and the cattle. He also poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. He told those who were selling the doves, take these things out of here, stop making my father's house a marketplace. His disciples remembered that it is written, zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews then said to him, what sign can you show us for doing this? And Jesus answered them, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, this temple has been under construction for 46 years, and you will raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of the body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this and they believe the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Today, as we continue our sermon series on Jesus, today we focus on the window in the top band of the Jeffrey window. This whole window is a window of Jesus' witness and ministry. It's the second window in and it's easiest to see because of the white sleeve that you see up uh, in the air that Jesus has raised. Would you join me in prayer? May the words of my mouth and the meditations of each one of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our salvation. Amen. What is your relationship with anger? Similarly, what is your relationship with justice? Where and when in your life has your absolute table-turning anger in the face of injustice moved you to flip a table, either literally or spiritually or figuratively? Today, anger growing out of social injustice collides in John 2 and the image in our Jeffrey window which is on your bulletin cover as well. In John 2, 13, Jesus walks into the temple of Jerusalem and is immediately confronted with injustice, being inflicted by the religious elites and their money-making minions who are busy extracting the last ounce of blood money from the poor people of Judaism. In the game of sacrificing animals to cleanse people's sins, Vendors are making a killing, selling cattle and sheep and doves to be turned into burnt offerings to God. Money changers like present day payday lenders are ripping off the poor by charging exorbitant rates as the poor get poorer and purchase these sacrificial animals. The rich buy the cattle, the middle class buy the sheep, and the poor if they choose to go in to deepen up debt, will buy doves in the economy of sacrifice, which packs the passageways in the temple of the Holy of Holies. Jesus' stomach is turning as vendors, money changers, and crowds of customers are doing the business of sacrifice everywhere around him with Passover arriving in Jerusalem to be celebrated while the odor of gouging the poor fills his nostrils and all of the air, along with the rising smoke of burnt animal flesh. Jesus has smelled enough. He has seen enough. He gets really, really mad. He focuses his anger as cold anger and he sits down and he weaves a whip of cords. Then he stands up and he rages. 
as he uses his whip to drive the cattle and the sheep, to drive the vendors and the money changers out of the temple. Tables are crashing, coins are flying, doves are flying all around the temple grounds, and Jesus yells about the doves, take these things out of here. Stop making my father's house a marketplace. This is not easy listening Jesus. This is not healing hands Jesus. This is not preaching peace Jesus. This is righteous anger Jesus. This is table turning Jesus. This is powerful and purposeful Jesus. This is just Jesus. With this action, just Jesus seals his own fate. You see, you don't challenge the economy of the religious power elites and walk away scot-free. By raising your voice and people's consciousness, you become the sacrificial lamb of God. You pay with your life. So we are seeing the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, setting up his own sacrifice for the life of the world. As he cleanses the temple, his actions create a mindset among his haters. We got him now. At this point, there's a major shift in the tone and the pace and the purpose of John's writing. It changes, everything changes in a single moment. The noise of the busy temple, the raucous righteous anger of Jesus all become still. All of a sudden, the gospel writer John takes over. He shifts his own style, he shifts his language, he shifts his tone to focus on what he believes this all means. Quite frankly, the church has spent more than 2,000 years calming good church people down by piling up misinterpretations on the text that comes next. We want the whipping, waving Jesus to just go away. Just Jesus is not good for our image, it's not good for publicity. Church growth efforts will be stymied by this one. John helps neutralize Jesus, and he does it through the disciples, the religious leaders, and the crowd. First, the disciples respond as they try to make sense out of just Jesus by turning what he's done to an ancient text from Psalm 69.9 to reveal that this is just the zeal of the Lord at work in the temple. I don't think they get it. Then the Jewish leaders respond by questioning Jesus' action and his radical closing words, which will later be used to charge him for crimes punishable unto death. Destroy this temple, he says, and in three days I will raise it up. They use that against him. Then as the crowds respond in understandable confusion and almost with the absence of meaning, John steps into the scene. Remember who John is. John is the beloved disciple. And he became the beloved disciple because he called himself the beloved disciple. No one else called him that. It would be like me becoming the beloved pastor because I said I was the beloved pastor. I've never understood that part about John. More fully present than he has been up to this point, he offers an interpretation in the text. From his unique interpretive posture, he looks backwards from the crucifixion, backwards from the resurrection that has yet to come in the future. And he offers a strange new interpretation that he does matter-of-factly. He says, but he is speaking of the temple of his body. What? We were all watching what he was doing just a few minutes ago. John has turned this into something else. To me, it feels like a scene from a movie where everything freezes. You know the ones I mean. You see feathers flying in the air and they're just frozen there. Money flying in the air and it's frozen there. Cattle flying in the air and they're frozen there. Cattle stampeding, sheep running in every direction, vendors chasing their animals, money, money changers throwing their hands up, trying to catch their money, and the doves, of course, taking off everywhere. Everything is frozen. Even Jesus is frozen in a whip raised over his head, about to hit somebody or something. Everything is frozen, and it is pandemonium in the frozen scene. Into the frozen scene steps John, the gospel writer. He's the only one moving and speaking. It feels so weird. It feels to me like John doesn't know what to do with Jesus' righteous anger. And we can see that. I mean, we get that from our own experiences with righteous anger. It feels to me like he 
acknowledges what's happening, but then just turns it into spiritual language. Much has been said about this interpretive moment, about the shift from the temple to Christ's body, about the surety with which John distinguishes his words from this scene. But the radical thrower of tables, the whipper of all that is wrong, the righteous and angry word made flesh dwelling among us full of grace and truth becomes before our very eyes, the sacrificial lamb of God. We need to spend some time listening to other people interpret righteous anger. Let's hear what present day table turning women have said about Jesus's righteous anger. Instead of spiritualizing it, they contextualize it. So let's make this story our own. So John, if you're listening, and in honor of the women in Women's History Month, we're gonna move you out of the freeze frame and move in three powerful black women of faith. Black woman warrior, Audra Lord, poet for the ages, is the first to replace John in the scene. Audra shares her context and connection to Jesus's anger many years ago in a lecture about women responding to racism. She writes, my response to racism is anger. I have lived with that anger. I've ignored it, feeding upon it, learning to use it before it laid my visions to waste for most of my life. Once I did it in silence, afraid of the weight. My fear of anger taught me nothing. Your fear of that anger will teach you nothing. So face it and use it fearlessly. Now let's turn to Dr. Brittany Cooper, who enters our freeze frame. In her powerful book, Eloquent Rage, a black feminist discovers her superpower. She writes, black women have the right to be mad as hell. We have been dreaming of freedom and carving out spaces for liberation since we arrived on these shores. There is no other group save indigenous women who know and understand more fully the soul of the American body politic than black women, whose reproductive and social labor have made the world what it is today. And one more joins the scene, Cole Arthur Riley, from the Chesterton House Center of Christian Studies at Cornell University. Ms. Riley delivered this reflection of our table-turning savior during the heat of the protest following George Floyd's murder. She writes, we fear that to allow for anger is to become less than you, Jesus. So Jesus, let us meet the God of the prophets. For you tell the truth. You hold fury at injustice. You, in embodied anger, flipped the temple tables. Would you help us now to become faithful discerners of when to calm down and when to rouse, rejecting that anger which leads to bitterness or hatred of another, yet tapping into righteous rage when that which you've created is under abuse and neglect? The dignity of creation demands our emotions, and she finishes, make ours a beautiful rage. Make ours a beautiful rage. Listening to my African-American sisters, I feel the power of a beautiful rage and the righteousness of that rage as it comes together. It is as though Audra and Brittany and Cole were by Jesus' side as he was whipping his way through the temple and unleashing the Spirit of God with holy Passover power. Jesus was fed up. He was finished. He could no longer abide in the separation of love and justice. So in the spirit of justice, he was seeking to give back to the poor what was theirs, to give them back their money, to give them back their dignity, to give them back their real faith, to give them back their true love of God. And in the spirit of love, he was defending and protecting those among whom he had lived, where he had ministered and healed and taught and preached. He couldn't watch them lose anymore. He couldn't bear to witness his father's house or his beloved siblings being used and abused by thieves and charlatans who were operating in the safe shelter of an abusive religious temple system. It was out of love and protection, growing from his heart of justice for all, that Jesus righteously raged in the temple that morning. Love and justice 
always need to be together, hand in hand, as people are empowered to make change in this world. So I invite one more righteous warrior to enter the freeze frame, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. He spoke of the connection of love and justice better than anybody I know. He said, power without love is reckless and abusive, and love without power is sentimental and anemic. Power at its best is love implementing the demands of justice, and justice at its best is power correcting everything that stands against love. Amen. We are followers of the raging, righteous, whip-snapping son of a carpenter, son of God, and savior of the world. His image is in your hands right now, literally in your hands, in the front cover of your bulletin. Take a look, take a look. He is in our sanctuary every single Sunday looking down at us. He's looking at us. He wants to know how we're gonna handle this stuff. So he looks at us every day, every Sunday. So let's look at him. Look into his eyes. Really see the eyes of Jesus. See what he saw that day. With his eyes of love and justice, see what hurts and harms people. Through the eyes of Jesus, see why he was raging. It could make you rage too, and it should. He saw that economic injustice needed to end. He saw poverty needed to end. He saw abuse needed to end. And today he sees the same, and he sees that racism and sexism and heterosexism and homophobia and misogyny and mistreatment of people anywhere is tearing us apart, and it needs to end. So in our freeze frame, look at his eyes. See the whip over his head in his hand. Now be his eyes and be his hands, clenched with a whip and pointing to the exit for any who abuse people. Get out of here. That's what the finger is saying, no, the hand is <laughs> saying, get out of here. Right? He's saying, get out of this room. It's not your house. It's my father's house. Through his eyes and through the power of his hands, Let's become table turners too. Let's really turn the tables. Using the eyes and hands of Jesus in our world, let us love people who others call loveless and whom are treated terribly every single day. Let us confront what is wrong and do what is right. Let us protect those who need it and serve those who are not protected and are not served by policies and procedures and behaviors that hurt and kill black and brown siblings at an amazing rate. Let us defend every American's basic right to work, to food, to safe and affordable housing, to medical care that helps and education that brings them up. Yesterday on the west side of the Ohio State House, hundreds and 10 of us from First Church joined in solidarity with the Poor People's Campaign. We listened to many men and women speak out of their own experience of poverty and pain. Just a few things, though, to leave with. Did you know that this morning we have 140 million Americans living below the poverty level? Did you know that among developed nations we are ranked 38th? 38th in care of the poor. Did you know that today 800 Americans will die of poverty. And poverty is the fourth leading cause of death in our nation. And did you know that there are 85 million poor and low-income low income eligible voters who are not registered? So we have some work to do. We have work to do outside this sanctuary to right these wrongs. It says on the front, enter to worship. Honor to worship, depart to serve, but I'd like to change that for today at least. Enter to worship, depart to do justice. While charity is always needed to alleviate the effects of injustice, let us, as table turners, work for justice which eliminates the causes of injustice. As we do the work of love and justice, we need to know that justice will, make, will come across as unpopular at times. I have said many times, Prophets are not always the easiest people to get along with, but neither are nonprofits. 
I kind of like that. <laughs> so. Doing justice work might make us uncomfortable because justice leads to confrontation, while charity never really affects or challenges the status quo. We need to create a world where no one goes hungry and has to hunt for help for the day because they have no livable wage or no good job or no place to call home. We don't need food pantries and free lunches for homeless shelters for homeless people in shelters if we nourish everyone who is in our community. I pray today that God will make ours a beautiful rage as we come to Christ's table of grace, which has not yet been turned over as far as I can see. Let us come to the table of grace to receive the gift of life and love and justice from our table-turning Savior. And I pray that we receive food for our journey to justice. Amen.